the Lord for allowing you and I to be in his presence of this day of mercy, to seek the mercy of God and to avail ourselves of his boundless mercy. The Bible says that the mercies of God are renewed every day. That's why you and I are not destroyed. They are renewed every day. Yesterday's mercy is not the same as today's mercy. Why? Because the challenges of today are different from the challenges of yesterday. Each day deserves its own mercy. So today we are reading from the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 19 to 25. The book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 19 to 25. This is a book that, that was poured out to the church in Galatia. And in this chapter we're talking about the works of the flesh and the works of the spirits. Now, chapter 19, verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. That means they are obvious. You don't have to look for them, they're easily seen. They're plain. And what are this? Adultery. We list all of them, and then it ends by saying, and such like. Meaning that this list is not ex ex exclusive, it's not exhaustive. There are many others that are not named. If you were to name all of them, the whole Bible would fill with them. So we just name the most important ones, and it, you know, expects us to know the rest or guess the rest. So is that plain? In other words, they're not hidden. Now, what are the, when it says the works of the flesh, it means the things that you and I like to do without God's control, without God's guidance. The things your body would like to do, your, your body, your mind would like to do, if you remove God's influence on your life. In other words, this is, these are things that a godless, a godless person would do. Somebody who doesn't know Jehovah God, that's what they would do. That's what they would do. So, in such by saying adultery. What is adultery? Adultery is when you have an affair with somebody who is not your wife in the physical. Now, it also applies to you having an affair with the world. Because we are supposed to be God's God's uh, God's bride. Is a bridegroom, and excuse me. Sorry about that. Sorry for the interruption. Let's just quickly correct the uh, camera angle. So. So we're supposed to, so when you say fornication, uh, adultery, it means you're having an affair with the world as well. Because you're supposed to be married to God as a child of God. When you leave God and you go to another God, then you are guilty of committing adultery spiritually. In the physical realm, it means that you that you're married to somebody, you've left your legally married wife and want to have an affair with somebody who's not your wife. But in the spiritual realm, many people are guilty of that. Why? Because they're supposed to be children of God, but they need God to go and seek help from another God. That is spiritual adultery. So don't think that, don't start boasting to say that, oh, I haven't committed adultery. Have you committed adultery in your mind? Have you committed adultery by what you've done? Have you gone to seek help and guidance from another God other than Jehovah God? If you have done that, you have committed adultery in the spirit realm, in the spirit realm. Then fornication. Fornication is when somebody who is not married has an affair. Because according to God's injunction, sex is all supposed to be expressed only by people in a legally married relationship. God does not expect you and I to have affairs when we are not married. When you do that, you are guilty of fornication. And how many people today are guilty of fornication? We know in the youth today, sexual promiscuity is so common. 
Many people do not wait to get married before they have affairs with the opposite sex. This is a serious sin against God because it means that you are already devout and when you eventually married, you are not fresh for your husband anymore. You know, all you are your husband, you are not fresh, you devout yourself. Yeah, but don't think fornication is only physical in terms of sex. Jesus Christ said, well, if you lost after a man and woman in your hearts, imagine that you're going to have an affair with them. You already committed fornication with them. So again, there's a spiritual aspect and there's a physical aspect. The physical aspect is when you physically perform the act with a human being, but when you do it in your heart, or when you look at a magazine, a pornographic magazine, and watch a movie, maybe on your phone, you are also committing fornication. You are defiling your spirit and you are guilty of the act of fornication. So all these areas you will explore. Today, the youth are fond, not only really the youth, eh, most people are fond of watching photographic on their phones because the media is so readily available. Just as you're looking through something on your phone, you just say photographic uh, image comes up. What are you going to do? Are you going to immediately delete it? Or are you going to keep on watching? You see? So this are the things we need to work on in our lives. God is saying that all these things are things that your flesh would like to do without God's control. You see, the only thing that's limiting you as a child of God from doing those things is the pulling of the Holy Spirit in your life. Without that Holy Spirit pulling you and telling you this is wrong, don't do this, convicting you of sin, righteousness and judgment, most of us will be doing all these things. Now, the go to Ephesians 5. Verse 3. Next chapter, verse 5, verse 3. And that says, For fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let not be once named among you as the covenant saints. Saints are the children of God, are the covenant children of God. So it says that fornication and all uncleanliness, when you refer to uncleanliness, it means sexual immorality. You know, adultery. And you with language, you with behavior, exposing your bodies, that kind of thing. Or covetousness is when you seek something that's not your own. For instance, the covetous of your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's car. So let not be once named among you. See? Not once. So let it even appear. If you are a saint. Most of us are supposed to be saints, but our behavior belies that. So we talked about cleanliness already, sexual immorality, unclean behavior, unclean speech, something lewd, something dirty. That is uncleanliness. It is a sin against God. Then the seriousness refers to party spirits. People who always enjoy going to parties, um, going to dance and parties and things like that. You don't have to go to a party to be happy. God, you can have a party with the Holy Spirit right where you are. So don't think you have to go to a party, no. Some people they're not happy because they go to parties. Because that spirit is in them. So again, this is a sin against God. God wants you to seek Him all the time. It's not that God doesn't want us to have fun, but it's the kind of fun you have. Okay, what do you do at parties? You start lost to each other, imagining all kinds of things in your heart. Planning to take a man or woman to bed, drinking alcohol, smoking, using drugs, gossiping, backbiting, evil looking, committing adultery with your eyes, you know, committing fornication with your eyes. Do you know the sin of fornication with your eyes? You know, even before you think in your heart, you've already committed this sin with your eyes, and you look lustfully at a, at a man or woman. So these are the works of the flesh. These are the things your body. This is why uh, uh, King David said, "In sin did my mother conceive me." Any human being that is born will do all these things without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, because that's where their body is made to behave. This is the works of the flesh. Your body will normally do all these things without the Holy Spirit pulling you back. 
So those people who are not born again, who have the Holy Spirit of God pulling them back and convincing them, they can easily fall into any of these sins and commit them. This is why we I need to be born again and therefore to have the Holy Spirit of God to control us, to guide us. Idolatry. Well, what is an idol? Is an idol, an idol is anything that takes the place of God or the importance of God in your hearts. It doesn't have to be an aerial, you know, carved idol. In many countries there are carved idols that worship in their homes, in their shrines. But you could also have an idol in your hearts, which is a, an image. It could be somebody that's important to you, it could be your husband, your wife, it could be your boss at work that you place so much emphasis on, more than you give to God. They are quite a time, it could be your car. It could be a film star, it could be a sports star. Some people pay hundreds of dollars for season tickets to well, watch football matches. But when they get to church, they pay only one or two dollars, if that. So those football matches are their gods because they are, in terms of their spending, that's what they spend more money on than God Himself. If you, if you give God 50 cents and you, you buy a season ticket worth $300, Obviously, that is in the case more important to you than God. That's how we need to, we, we should know how much God means to you. You know, you can say you're a good Christian as much as you want, but show it by your actions. How much you give to God compared to what you give to uh, other things. So, an idol can be physical, or it can also be an image in your heart, it can also be something other than a carved idol that you put inside your heart on your shrine. Something that you adore so much, something you give so much time to, more than you give to God. It could be a television program. It could be a game. Some people gambling is an idol, you know? So many other things like that. Then witchcraft. What does witchcraft mean? You use the word loss. Basically, witchcraft means control, power to control other people. To change people's lives to do what you want them to do. So that somebody comes over and takes control of your life and begins to manipulate your life to what they want, not what you want. And this is against your will. And so they use the force of darkness to do this. They use all power of darkness, all kinds of evil spirits to control people, to make them do things against their will, not what they want to do, but what will satisfy the people that possess them. This is witchcraft. And of course, we know that those who use the force of darkness can be the light. God is light. So if you are to witchcraft, you are employing the force of darkness to do your evil works, and you cannot be in the light. Now, there are many people in the church who claim to be Christians, but who also do witchcrafts. Many leaders in the church are to witchcraft problems. Many of them are sorcerers. But they might be pretending they are church members of the whole world, but God knows who they are. And on the day of judgment, they'll be exposed and they will see their just deserts. Now, many of them will be deceived that no, it's okay, everybody does it, I just tell them, we just go to protect me so that nobody kills me, so that nobody attacks me, and all this stuff. That's a lame excuse. If you cannot trust God to protect you, and you rather trust part of darkness, then it does make you belong. Hatred, well, wow, that's a strong word. Hatred means you have a feeling of dislike in your heart against another human being so much that you don't mind harming them. You know? So hatred is not of God because God is love. We're supposed to love our fellow human beings as each other. And God loves us. So rather than hate somebody, you have to give them to God and go to forgive them, to change their hearts. For instance, somebody might hate you. But it doesn't mean that you have to hate them in return. That is says you return good for evil. It says, for by so doing, you keep burning coals on the heads. Let God be who will fight for you, who will fight for yourself. Don't entertain malice or hatred in your hearts. Because if you do that, it's a, it's a dark stain in your hearts. And the Holy Spirit will be able to you know, minister to you to move your life because the darkness has entered 
Whenever you end up in bitterness or hatred or malice against somebody, you it's like you're, you're building something dark, a bitter roots, sort of ruining your heart, and that will change the Holy Spirit away. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of love. You can get angry at people, yes, holy anger, but that says don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Let it go before you go to bed. Forgive, and shall be forgiven by God. Variance means arguments, separation. In other words, people who are always enjoying arguing, they always like to prove their points. The root cause of that is pride, because they believe they know more than any other person. That's why they just argue endlessly. And then you think they will argue, argue, because inside they feel that they know better and that they should always reign. So pride and anger are together. But again, these are simple acts. You know, God doesn't want to be angry. If you're angry about a holy thing, somebody like Jesus drew, drew out, he drove out the money changes in the temple. That's holy anger because we're doing something unrighteous. But the Bible says, don't let the sun go down when you're around. Walk away, wait, you get one together, you wait for about 10 minutes, walk away from the place. That way you're less likely to commit a sin. But then you come back, that anger will have settled. Anger is like a fire that burns, that destroys. So don't let the bitter of anger stay inside you. Then emulations means envy, it's people who envy each other. Envy is the mother of murder. It was the envy of Cain that made of his brother Abel that made him to kill him. The first murder in the Bible, in fact, of all humanity. It was the envy of the brothers of Joseph that made them send him into slavery. But we know how God rescued him. So once you start envying somebody, know that it is not the spirit of from God, the spirit of Satan. Ask God to cast down yourself, deliver yourself. Ask God to free you from that spirit. Ask God to, you know, give you a spirit of contentment with what you have. You know, don't start saying, oh, that person is special. I wish he was dead. I wish he was in this. No, 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 no. Whatever God has given you, be satisfied with it. Then, wrath. Wrath means great anger. Just talk about anger briefly. Wrath means somebody is really, 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 really angry. That's right, enough to kill you. This, again, is an evil spirit. The Bible says that anger and wrath gives a big foothold to the devil. In other words, when you get that state, you get so angry, the devil can use it to do anything. You can kill people, you can shoot people, you can stab people, you can destroy houses, you can destroy property. I mean, you can do anything because then it's no longer you in control. But it's Satan controlling you at that time. What happens is when you get so angry, you don't deal with it, you don't display, you don't get rid of it. What happens? They open the door for Satan to come in. And we know Satan is a destroyer. Jesus Christ said it. Satan has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But he has come to give us life and life more abundantly. So when you get angry and see your wrath, you open a wide door for Satan is demons to enter you. And at that stage, you are under their control. You can say the wrong things, abuse people, insult them, curse them. Then you can kill people, destroy property, burn people, you know, all kinds of evil things can be done. You will not see somebody who is wrathful preaching the gospel to another person or forgiving somebody. No, 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 no. That is not. They can only do evil when you are in your wrath. You cannot do good. So instead of getting to that stage, walk away. Give it to God. Ask for the spirit of patience and humility. Again, strife is the same thing, fighting. And in, in many churches, there are many groups, people fighting each other, different uh, uh, organizations, different groups. Oh, I don't like that group, so we don't talk to them, we keep minds with them. No, no, no. God wants us to be in the spirit of love and unity. By this, men know that you belong to me when you love one another. When you are struck in the church, it's the work of Satan. It's not the work of God. And the book of James says, don't boast about it. That spirit does not come from God. Strife, division, malice, all those things. They are the works of the flesh 
and they are not from God. So we've got James, says all these things are things of the flesh, you must not boast about them. We go to James chapter 3 verse 13, verse 14, he says, but if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descended not from above, but is aptly sensual devilish. See? Aptly sensual devilish. But where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Satan is the author of all these things. Wrath, envy, strife. He is the author of confusion of God. The Bible says, God is not the other confusion. So we must be very careful that we do not entertain or allow strife and divisions to, to, to come in between us. Because when we do that, we are walking for Satan. We are doing the work of Satan in a certain way. You might think, oh, somebody offended you. That's why you said this. Said, no, 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 no. It is Satan that you are actually working for. We allow envy and strife. And seditions mean, means, means different groups. Seditions means that, like in a church, people who want to separate from the pastor, they gang up against the pastor, they form their own church, they leave the church. Are you a part of that kind of group right now in your life? Are you a part of a group that divides the church, separates and goes to form your own church somewhere else because for some reason you don't agree with the pastor? then you are committing a sin and this is a work of the flesh because if you are in the spirit you would not do that you will pray for the pastor ask God to change his heart and you also pray for yourself you see so uh, it's very important to know that these things because many people don't know they think by doing these things that uh, they are all okay uh, we just fight for our eyes and all this is no we must recognize them for what they are these are the works of the flesh and as we are going to read later on, those who do, do those things will not repeat, will not enter the kingdom of God. I'm sure you want to enter the kingdom of God, you want to enter paradise of God, right? Yes, everyone listening to me, you want to do that. But do you practice any of these things? Are any of these things present in your life? If they are, you need to repent, ask God to forgive you, and ask God to take them out of your life. Because if you continue, you will certainly not enter that paradise of God. I'm sure you don't want that. So these are things you want to watch against. The family says heresies. Heresies are things that are untrue against God. You know, when you say untrue things against God, you're heretical. You know, you, you, for instance, if you call the Holy Spirit, you know, what kind of names or all Jesus' names or that kind of thing and use the name of God in vain and being heretical. You know, it means you are blaspheming. You are saying something which is untrue. On the God's standards, you are, you, are, you are maligning the name of God or the work of God in one way or another. We already mentioned envies and emulations, copying each other, murders. Well, Jesus said, if you call your brother Raka, which means fool, you are actually guilty of murder before God. So, you don't have to kill somebody physically. With your mouth, you can kill others. When you gossip about them, and um, assassinate their character, and malign them, and slander them, you are guilty of murder. So, when you look at people who murder them, you start staring at them and, and talking bad about them, you may also be guilty of the same thing before God because of what you have said with the mouth. See? What you have said with the mouth. So, very careful uh, in what you write about people, what you say about people. Even your heart, you can commit murder in your heart. You know? When you think evil, that you wish somebody was dead. Well, if you wish them to dead, be dead, that means that if you have the power, you could also kill them and you know, you're just as guilty as somebody who actually killed them because in your heart, you have killed them already. Drunkenness, that's very straightforward. When you cannot control your alcohol consumption in the first place, the child of God should not 
be drinking any form of alcohol, zero alcohol. If you have alcohol in your system, then the Holy Spirit cannot dwell there. Take that from me. So don't let anybody deceive you. Uh, some people quote that passage in Timothy where that was Paul told Timothy to take a little bit of wine for his stomach. Well, that's because in those days they didn't have medications. They only really used things like uh, a lot of heal uh, diseases you know, to, uh, to sanitize wounds and things like that. It's not to be taken as a license to go and start drinking. But after all, the, the Bible says that wine is a brother. And those who are deceived by it are fools. The disciples who drink of us fools. Because it's a weapon of Satan. When you begin to drink like that, you cannot control it. Very soon you get drunk. And what happens when you get drunk? You begin to do what you not normally do. Like expose your bodies in public, uh, ease yourself in public, beat people, fight, and say things that you eventually regret. Because once you get drunk, you are no longer yourself, another spirit is in you, is possessing you, and the end of this is to destroy you. You can't get drunk and start driving, you end up killing somebody or killing yourself. I used to know a Christian who was paralyzed from the waist down. And this happened after he got involved in an accident and having got to drink, got drunk. He had an accident in his car. See? So the ways of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. You must work against this sin. When they say don't drink, there's a reason for that. Because you know the consequences, many people get drunk and the process they, they shoot their wives or their husbands. They kill people, you know, um, because you are no longer yourself. Some, some other spirit, the demon spirit is now controlling you. See? So that, that's why they say you should not drink. That's a reason for it. And most of all, a child of God should never drink alcohol. Never. Not even one. In fact, if you look at the book of uh, Judges chapter 6, the vow of Nazareth, Numbers chapter 6, rather, so the, the Nazarite, the Nazarite, somebody who who makes a vow of God, separates himself unto God for a season, and in that passage you'll see that Nazarites are not even allowed to take the the, 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 the grapes because grape is fermented for alcohol, so they're not even permitted to take it. Not even the trace of alcohol must be in their system while they're consecrated to God. You see. So this shows you that alcohol in your system and the Holy Spirit cannot dwell together. You must choose one. If you want the Holy Spirit to dwell in your system, then don't even call me alcohol. I mean, they sell all this non-alcoholic drink, but if the, 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 the truth is that they do contain some alcohol, which is eventually fermented in your body. So you must avoid all forms of alcoholic, non-alcoholic drinks. Give your body for the Holy Spirit to dwell in. The Holy Spirit that dwell in only a holy vessel, pure. Then reverence and such like. We also mention reverence and party spirits, people who are out uh, drinking, shouting, all this. The reverence that's what it means. You know, like to go in groups, you know, going out to parties, uh, shouting, drinking, all those things. Okay? These are all, and his family says, and such like, of the which I tell you before, I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. See? They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So the question is, which of these things are you doing in your life right now? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. And it says that, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminates, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkenness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. Those are people that kidnap people or force people to pay money that due to them blackmail people, you know, extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And some 
Such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So, if you claim to be a child of God, if you claim to be born again, it means that you are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. If you are sanctified in that blood, and you are justified in His name, justified, justification means just a secret of sin. You know that was, you are declared innocent before God. If that's the case with you, then why are you still being involved in fornication or adultery? Hmm? In adultery, you're supposed to be an elder in the church and you have an affair with another person in your church, a female member of your church, probably married to somebody else. How can you claim to be a child of God if you as a shepherd you are involved in that kind of activity? Or you don't have to be a shepherd, you could be the choir man, so you could be an evangelist, you could be uh, a side man or woman. Yes, you cast your eye on, the, on this woman and you are having a fear with her. The serious thing is gone. You are supposed to be washed. Why are you dating your body and spirit all over again? So you have to be pure and holy. Your vessel, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in that body. So, you must keep your body pure before God for Him to continue to dwell there. So, I told you before that those who do such things shall not, repeat, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Alright? So, as I said, most of you watching me want to possess the kingdom of God, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, but you must make sure that your body is pure before God. Any of these things we mentioned, you can go back and read about them. Galatians 5, uh, verses 19 to 21. Make sure that you are not involved in any of these practices. And if you are, ask God to forgive you, repent before God, ask God to deliver you from that, that condition, from that weakness. Whether you are watching pornography, or you are fornicating with somebody, or you are stealing, um, or you are constantly having malice in your heart and hatred in your heart against people. You know? All those things are God to go out. If you really do it in seriousness, in minutes, God will help you to deliver you from it so that you can continue your walk to the kingdom of heaven. But if you keep on giving excuses and say, oh, I know I'm trying to do it, I keep on repeating it. It will lead you to hell. It's very simple. Jesus Christ said, if your eye makes you sin, take a knife and pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven with one eye than to have your whole body with two eyes burning in flames for eternity. Well, maybe you don't believe in hell. Well, you certainly believe it when you get there. By that time, it's too late because once you get to hell, is permanent. You can never get out. There's no second chance. Look at the story of the rich man of God. Look, he asked for that ground to send Lazarus to his brothers on the arm. But they do not come to where he was. Hell is real. Better believe it. If you keep on denying it, you will go there and regret for the rest of your existence. All right. So for the fruit of the Spirit, what does it mean the fruit of the Spirit? If you see a tree, a pear tree, or an apple tree, how do, you, how do you know what kind of fruit it is? Or if you see an apple, or a pear, or a banana, an orange, you say, this has come from a banana tree, or this apple is from an apple tree, or this orange is from an orange tree, right? Or this grapes are from a grape tree. Right? So you know what produced those fruits. So the same when it says the fruits of the Holy Spirit, it means that these are the results of the Holy Spirit dwelling in a person. If you see these signs, these characteristics in them, you know the Holy Spirit is in them. Jesus Christ said, by the fruits you shall know them. What are those fruits? Those things that you, your behaviors that would determine what kind of person you are, what kind of spirit is inside you. You cannot be claiming 
to be a child of God. When you are busy lying, fornicating, uh, defrauding people, uh, hating people in your heart, and all those things we just mentioned as the works of the flesh, and claim to be a child of God with the Holy Spirit within you. No, it doesn't work like that. You go by your fruits, by what you show, by the way you speak, the way you dress, they will know what kind of spirit is in you. You don't have to tell anybody. You have to write it to say, I'm a child of God or I have the Holy Spirit. No, they can easily know from the behaviors we show. Now, what are these evidences of the outpourings of the evil of the Holy Spirit in you? It is love. That's the first one. Love is the most important characteristic of a Christian, the highest characteristic of a Christian. Because when you love, you are like God. Why? Because God is love. God is love. The Bible says that God makes his son to shine on the wicked and the just. He doesn't say, oh, this house has a witch in it. Because of that, they will not have any, any sunshine on them. They will freeze to death. No? He doesn't say, oh, this house is full of robbers. So because of that, they will have no rain. No. Yes, it is rain to shine on the sun, shine on them. Just why? Because it wants them to repent. So you too must be like God. God does not have a grudges. If you go to First Corinthians 13, we can really quickly the characteristics of love and see what this love means. It's not this love doesn't mean the kind of selfish human love. People say, Oh, I love you to a, a member of the opposite sex. It's not sexual at all. No, no, no. It's going to do with the sex or physical things. This is a spiritual love. It's called a gap in love. It is a love that does not differentiate from conditional love. A love that loves you even when you are wicked to them. Even when you hate them. Like Jesus prayed for those that uh, crucified him. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. Which was true. He said, thing. Satan prayed for those that stoned him to death. He said, Father, forgive them. That is unconditional love. That's godly love. So the characteristics of love, that like 1 Corinthians 13, says, No, I give all my good to the poor, and I give my body to be burned, I have not love, it doesn't profit me. Love suffers long, is kind, it does not envy, it is not, it's not proud, does not behave itself on sin, doesn't seek his own, is not easily provoked, are you easily provoked? Doesn't think of any evil, doesn't rejoice in iniquity, or rejoices in the truth, he bears all things, believes all things, hopes in all things, endures all things. Do you endure all things? Says love never fails. But what there are prophecies they will fail. Where there are tongues they will stop. Where there is, there is knowledge it shall vanish away. So, and finally ends by says that uh, now, out of all this faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of this is love. What's going on? 13, 13. The greatest of these is love. It's the supreme characteristic of a human being. If you can have that, you have everything. If you have love, you will not hate your neighbor. You will not covet their goods. You will not speak evil of them. You will not kill them. In fact, you will fulfill the law. So love was number one. They joy. Joy is a spirit that is happy, but it's more than happiness. Because joy can exist when there's nothing to be happy about. That Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Ayana 10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So that joy of the Lord, you can be both with it full time and still be full of joy. Because it's paid from God. It doesn't depend on your circumstances. Happiness, yes, depends on circumstances, but not joy. Joy is the same, regardless, constant, because it's the proof of the indwelling spirit of God in you. So, the next one is peace. Again, Jesus Christ said, My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. The peace of God passes on understanding. 
It seems not to go in the sense that it doesn't depend on circumstances. It will be going through a difficult time and still have peace. Instead of your heart being up and down, very worried. Remember the story of that man that wrote that song, It Is Well With My Soul? And the story goes that he sent his family ahead of him to go to England by ship in the early 40s and the ship sank and he lost his wife and three, the four children. And he received the tex, the, te uh, the, the, uh, the message that he had lost his wife and kids on the sea. And that's when he wrote that song. When peace like a river attends my soul. It is well with my soul. See, that's the peace of God. It overrides the circumstances. Because it's God Himself in you that can give you that peace. Again, all this is because you have the Holy Spirit in you. God, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you. That's why you can have this peace regardless of the circumstances in your life. That's why you can have this joy regardless of what you're going through. That's why you can have that love, the unconditional love of God, is simply because of the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in your heart. If you don't have that Holy Spirit, you can't have that kind of peace, you can't have that kind of joy, you can't have that kind of love. No. You'll be somebody who hates, who revenges, who gets angry, who has all those works of the flesh. So when you see somebody with these features, we know that they have the presence of the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Then long suffering. When you suffer long, you know what that means? It means you're able to bear the people's failures. You don't immediately judge them, you don't immediately castigate them, you don't put them down. John 15, 22. Let's go to do some John 15. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13, 7. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. And that says, Bear all things, believe in all things, hope all things, endure all things. Again, we read that before. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. And let's uh, so review Romans 15, 14. Romans 15, 14. Romans 15, 14. And that says, And I myself also may persuade of you, my brother, that you also are full of goodness, still with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another, to correct and encourage one another. Then John 15, verse 2. Book of John, chapter 15, verse 2. John 15, verse 2 says, Every branch in me that bears no fruit, be taken away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that he bring forth more fruit. So, the plan of Jesus for you and I is to bear fruit for him. We are like branches of a tree. So, if you're not bearing fruit for Jesus, well, it starts by saying, I'm the true vine. He's the tree. And my father is the husband man or the gardener. Jesus is the tree. We are the branches. His father God is the gardener that keeps the tree. So if you child of God a branch in him. And if that branch is not producing fruit, then it gets cut off. Because what's the point? He's just using the nutrients. Just drinking the water, getting the sun, all those things, but nothing. A tree has value only by the fruits it produces. If a tree is not bearing fruit, then it will be cut down because it's just taking up space for nothing. It's not producing anything useful for anybody. You see? So we must bear fruit for Jesus Christ. He is the tree where the branches. If you don't bear fruit, it's going to cut us off. And if you bear fruit, then it will purge us. That means he will make us bear more fruit because that is what he wants. He wants us to bear fruit for him. So, it says that abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abides in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. So, the only way you can bear fruit for Jesus is to stay connected with him. Imagine if the branch cuts off from the Tree. How would it survive? It cannot survive because it gets all its nutrients, all its water from the tree itself. Because the tree has roots that go in the ground. 
that pick up the nutrients and distribute the nutrients to all the branches. So if that branch is disconnected from the tree, it cannot survive. Say, so no more can you accept your vine than me. I am the vine, you are the branches. That's John 15 verse 5. He that abided in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. You cannot be at food without Jesus. Jesus has to be living in you through his Holy Spirit for you to bear this fruit we're talking about. If a man abides not in me, he is cast off as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they burned. If you, if you abide in me and I was abiding in you, you shall ask what you will and shall be done unto you. So it's both ways. You abide in him and his words, which are spirit and life, abide in you. Are God's words abiding in you? Well, they cannot abide in you, you read them. You got to read them, you got to meditate on them, for them to abide in you. So when you abide in you and you abide in Jesus, then whatever you ask for, it will be done for you. That's the secret to answer, answer prayers. So moving on, and it continues to say gentleness. So gentleness is somebody who is gentle, somebody who does not push himself forward. It's control. Goodness, again, very similar. Faith. And this that person believes in God. That was says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please God without faith. You must have faith to believe in God. So if you don't have faith, that means you don't believe in God. You don't believe in God, or your faith is very little, then you cannot please God. See? So the only way you can please God is if you have faith. And that's because the Holy Spirit is dwelling inside you. So the first thing is to get that Holy Spirit. How do you get it? When you surrender your life to Christ and you are born again. Then the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside you. Without that, you cannot get the Holy Spirit. You cannot get the Holy Spirit without good works. You, mean that you, you, you might be a Christian for the past 50 years. It does not mean you have the Holy Spirit. It does not mean you are born again. Then meekness, meekness is power with control, control power. For instance, since Jesus was meek and lowly, why? He had the power to destroy those who came to arrest him, but he did not. Even when he said, it is I, they all fell down before him. And they allowed himself to be arrested. That's meekness. You have the power, but control it. You don't use the power. As what? Temperance, again, as a form of control. Somebody who is temperate means somebody who is controlled in their approach to issues. They don't shout, they don't get excited, they don't, you know, go over the ball. They are controlled in their emotions and their behaviors. Let's go to 1 Timothy 1 9. Book of 1 Timothy 1 9. See what I'm talking about. 1 Timothy 1 9 says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and mothers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers as prostitutes, for them that defile themselves of mankind as homosexuals, for men sinners, kidnappers, for liars, for perjured persons, people lie hope. And will there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine? That's the law was made for them. Somebody who is in spirit, who has the spirit of God living in them, the law is not made for you because you will not do any of those things anyway. Meekness, temperance against such, there is no law. See? So all this, you, you never see a law saying that, oh, if you don't have love, you be penalized, or if you have gentleness, or if you have gentleness, be penalized for being gentle, or be penalized for having love, or be penalized for having long suffering, or meekness or temperance, or goodness or faith. There's no law like that. You, you, if you have those policies, you observe the law, there's nothing that accuses you before God. 
And says that they that are Christ, those that belong to Christ, they are crucified. That's a strong word. It means they have put to death the flesh with their affections and lusts. So that means that if you're having those affections, those worldly affections, those bodily affections and lusts in your hearts, in your members, it means you are not yet in Christ. Because if you are truly in Christ, all those things will no longer be active in your life. Romans 6, verse 6. Romans 6, verse 6. Let's see what it says. Those that are Christ are crucified. They put to death. How? Through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They nail those passions to the cross. Through this tradition of the cross. So if you have not yet nailed those things, if you have passions, fornication, murder, drunkenness, hatred, variance, seditions, heresies, emulations, all those things, it means you are not yet crucified. Romans 6 verse 6 says, Knowing this that our old man is crucified with him, see, that the man who was before we came to know Christ. So when you come to know Christ, that old man is crucified, is nailed to the cross, that the body of sin which you have before might be destroyed, exactly as was referring to. That body that makes you sin, that makes you fornicate, that makes you lie, cheat, and murder, that body will be crucified when you come to Christ. But henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead, he that is crucified, that body is crucified, is free from sin. And if we be dead in Christ, we believe that we shall also be with him. It's a very important principle. When you come to Christ, that's your old man of sin that made you fornicate and uh, do commit adultery and lie and cheat and without hesitation. That old man is crucified near the cross. And once that name or that, that body dies, so you are free from sin. In other words, you are no longer a slave to sin. Not that you cannot sin, but you now you have power to say no. Whereas before, you couldn't say no. See? That's why you want to be born again. It's through the born again experience that your old man is nailed to the cross and you are freed from sin. Now you have power to say no to sin. And you are just not a slave doing, committing sin willy nilly as you did before. So then that Christ have crucified the flesh with affections and loss. That if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Very important statement. If we live in the spirit, what does that mean? If you live in the spirit, it means you reside in the spirit. That's where you are 24 7. And if you do that, when you walk, meaning your daily activity, your daily interaction with other people, you will also be controlled by the Holy Spirit. You see, you cannot live 24 7 in the spirit and walk in the, with the devil. It's not possible. That spirit in you is still with you. As you're walking out of your house, as you're talking to people, as you're folding, as you're bathing, that Holy Spirit is in you. That's what it means that you walk in the spirit. It means the activities you do will be controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's simply because you have lived in the spirit, you have recited in it, you, you read his word, you, you be with him. You know? So show me your friend that tells you who you are. It's whoever you recite with, whoever you spend time with. That's what will show your attitude. In Romans 8, 4 and 5. Look, Romans 8, 4 and 5. And it says that the righteousness of the law will fulfill in us who walk not after the flesh. What does that mean? That means we don't do the activities of the flesh as we talked about earlier. All those things, witchcraft, envy, strife, wrath, we don't do them. You know? Who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit? Rather we walk after the spirit and so we have the fruits of the spirit in us. For they that are after the flesh, okay, do mind the things of the flesh. For they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. But if we cannot imagine the death, that means if you follow the things of the flesh, it means if you die spiritually, it means hellfire, it means perdition. But the spiritual mandate is life, it's eternal life with Jesus, it's paradise, and peace. See, very important. 
So these are very powerful things we've read today. May God grant us the power to always live and walk in the Spirit and to help us deny the flesh and all these expectations that uh, we might really inherit the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Jehovah, Jesus Christ, Holy my God, the God of the truth, the God of the life, we thank you for the words you spoke to our hearts tonight. Let the seeds of life produce a hundred for harvest in those who hear this message. Heavenly Lord, give us the power over our flesh, give us the power to crucify flesh as we come to you in holiness and righteousness. Let the fruit of the Spirit be manifested in our lives. Let us not miss the kingdom of heaven for anything. Let your truth set us free. Open our eyes to see you as you truly are. Let us have your mercy today. In Jesus' mighty and righteous name I pray. Amen, 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 Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus.